Good morning, everyone. Thank you so very much for gathering here today. It's a huge honor to be up in front of you and, uh, and speaking to you. Don't worry about tweeting or Facebooking anything that's conf uh, confidential, because I am not an expert uh, on anything except lemons and bluefish. Uh, so I have nothing that's unpublished. Um, <laughs> And that is actually how I want to start off, is that I, I'm not an expert. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm a little different from a lot of my colleagues here at National Geographic. I'm not a PhD. I'm not a, uh, so focused on, on, a, uh, on one uh, discipline. But I am a witness to a drama that unfolds around each and every one of us every day. And that's the hat with which I want you to listen to my presentation, if you would, which is as a witness. The world of food is dramatic. And it really goes to explore everything about how we relate to our world. This quote here is one of my very favorites, spoken by a fisherman in the classic book Blues by John Hersey. In our quest for food, we begin to find our place in the systems of this world. And I've always absolutely adored this comment because it, it so accurately describes that we are not sovereign over our resources, but rather that we are because of them. And that through our resources, we begin to discover our place within this natural systems. I've had a very intimate and long relationship with food from a very early age. Family dinner in my house was a very important time. It was a place to share, to give, to receive. In fact, it was where my family became a family. And I was very lucky in that I was able to really participate in the production of these meals. Both of my parents were great cooks from scratch, and they were also very intrepid cooks. We were born and raised right here in Mount Pleasant in DC in a very multi-ethnic neighborhood, shopping at Korean, Eritrean, Ethiopian, Latino markets, shopping daily. In a, in a very un-American sense, and really coming home and, and enjoying the bounty of whatever we found at the market. And it was incredible, and it was such an experience. My father, I remember him making tacos, taco night from scratch, and he would moisten the masa harina dough, and these two little towhead boys would gently press the dough in the, in the, uh, you know, to form the tortilla. And you can imagine us you know, rapturously and wondered by this process that to everyone around us in the neighborhood, it's like, come on, this is eons of our history. But to us, it was a window an opportunity to explore how we connected to the people right next to us, who we played football with in the street, but yet we didn't understand, we didn't share their cultures. It was this fluency with food that allowed me to step out of the traditional path of education when in college I realized very quickly that the traditional path wasn't for me. Um, and it was the fluency with food that allowed me to find structure and, and guidance in my life in restaurants. And restaurants really became my laboratory. I mean, I was first cultivating my ego. I was going to be the best chef in the world. It didn't work out so well. It worked out pretty well. But what I ended up realizing is what I really enjoyed about food was cultivating the relationships through it. And then cultivating really a deep understanding of what those relationships really mean to us in our world, in our communities, really as, as individuals. And of how we connect to a myriad number of human values through them. I became very interested in sustainable seafood. Uh, Sylvia Earle hates it when I show this. But I'm, I'm in the dead fish business, uh, which is a little bit different for a conservationist. And I've been in the business for a long time. I still get this excited over bluefish and nearly everything. Uh, this is a poor little sculpin, which I believe off the co coast of Cape Cod was my first, uh, first victim. But as a chef, I began to realize that some of my favorite species were disappearing. The crabs that I so lovingly caught off the docks of the Patuxent River when I was a child, the bluefish, the striped bass that I would pull out as a child easily, they were becoming scarce. They were becoming altogether unavailable. They were becoming exorbitantly expensive, prohibitively expensive. And I realized that it's really an opportunity and a burden that chefs have in that the cook has become the guiding hand of natural selection in our world. And it's the chefs who have wiped out bluefin, who have popularized shark fin soup, who have taken a little known species known as slimehead and turned it into a delicacy called orange ruffy. This is our fault. This is our opportunity. But it's also, if we can destroy we have the opportunity to begin to guide restoration through consumption. It's this belief that really evolved my passions outside of what a restaurant kitchen alone could provide for me. And uh, to really see food as a lens of exploration in a broader sense of how we relate to each other, our communities, our natural world, through the resources that we consume on a daily basis. And this has led me here to National Geographic, 
So my great friends, Dr. Enrique Sala, uh, John Fahey, the whole team, Alex Moen, Miguel Jorge, have been so generous and, and welcoming in their hospitality and bringing me into the fold. And you know, I've met so many incredible people here, utterly incredible talents. And some of my very favorites are the photographers. You know, I mean, just incredible, brave men and women sent out into the world to create a relationship, to take a snapshot then of that relationship as a souvenir to bring back to us, to publish in the vaunted pages of the Yellow Magazine. I mean, how many of us have had our lives changed by the look in one girl's eyes in Afghanistan? or had our whole understanding of a entire subject radically altered by the visions of Brian Scarry or the charisma of, of uh, Matthias. You know, I mean, it's incredible. But I've realized that just as the photographers take snapshots of banking through the hills of glacial Alaska, of the southern oceans, you know, down in, in parts of the world where most of us will never go, of the spice plantations of Madagascar, I mean, these are great relationships that you and I are most likely to never have. But how many of us have eaten Chilean sea bass? or sprinkled black pepper on a steak, or had a piece of Alaskan salmon. While National Geographic sends an expert eye in exploration of our world, so too do we, but we send our forks. It is how we relate to the world around us. And it's an opportunity that we have in this global ecosystem, global food system, to really begin to connect to the human values that really govern it. While I believe that there is still plenty to explore about our world, plenty new knowledge to gather. I believe really the next great phase of discovery is not finding new information, but making sense of the information that we already have to define our place in the systems of the world through the resources we take from it. My great friend and, doc uh, and mentor, uh, Dr. Carl Safina, has a wonderful quote, which I'm going to butcher here, but he said, we went from a hunter-gatherer society to an agrarian culture. From agrarian, we move to a civilized society. The next great leap in our evolution will be to become humanized. And I don't know of anything that is more human than the ritual of dinner. It is one of the traits that truly makes us as human beings unique as animals on this planet. And it's one of the things that really reminds us of really of what, what it is of the beauty that it is to be human, of the opportunity to commune. I want to tell a few stories of my travels around the world that really represent to me uh, really kind of the overarching narrative of my work, which is a lot of environmentalism focuses on, on the Garrett Hardin idea of the tragedy of the commons, of measuring the impact that we have had on ecosystems. And a lot of the work that I do, as I've been explaining, is sort of more about the communion of the commons, what it is that brings us together, what it is about our resources that actually unite us. Uh, one of my favorite women in the entire world, Dr. Patricia Malouf, down in Peru. She's a preeminent marine biologist, an incredible woman, and just a, a brilliant thinker. And Peru is home to the world's largest single species fishery, the Peruvian anchoveta. 10 million metric tons per year are taken out of the water. It's a huge number of fish. 97% of those fish get ground up and into a, what's called a reduction fishery. They're in the adhesive that binds curtains and carpets. They're in the polyurethane on the floors. They're in the lipstick, ladies, that you're wearing, the moisturizer on your face. They get fed to chickens, to pigs, to salmon in, in aquaculture farms. 97% of these go into an industrial use, 3% for human use. Peru is racked with poverty. It's racked with hunger. And they have a cultural taboo against eating anchovies. Strange. They have more anchovies than they need to feed the entire nation 10 times over. And the work that Patricia is doing is beginning to create market with great chefs such as Gaston Acurio and really bringing the idea of anchovies not as a, a reduction fishery, but really as something to celebrate, as something to put, forth, you know, put forthright on the plate and really pronounce as a, as a great cultural and natural resource for the Peruvian people and then to export it around the world. And it's a great story of just making better use of an existing resource, which is a lot of what the sustainability dialogue is really all about. And then another story that I love, uh, a few months ago, my wife and I were traveling in Switzerland, and we were up in the Alps in this tiny little village hamlet uh, called Frutigen. And up here, just outside of Zurich, about an hour out, uh, in beautiful you know, Hollywood setting of the Alps, this backdrop is absolutely incredible. And they had bored a tunnel through one of these mountains to connect two cantons and to promote trade and tourism and industry. 
and basically just to connect more of Switzerland to itself. And while they did this, they tapped into a geothermally heated spring. And out of either side of the tunnel came 100 liters per second of 68 degree water. Now on one side of the tunnel, this was really seen as a liability. I mean, this environment is not 68 degrees. The water there is, is more closer to 40. So just dumping 68 degree water into the lakes, into the streams, would kill all the flora and the fauna and ruin the whole ecosystem. So in a you know, stroke of good thinking, they realized, oh my, we can't do this. So we're going to build an energy intensive plant to remove the energy from the, from, remove the heat from the water and pass it down into the streams. On the other side, there's this Romanian engineer who had this idea. He was part of this project. And he said, you know what? You know what this village really needs? I got 68 degree water. We need bananas. You know, when I think of Switzerland, I, I think of cows and bananas. <laughs> so he built this greenhouse here. And it's absolutely incredible. And in it, he's growing these bananas. And he's got spices. He's got cinnamon and nutmeg, cloves and cardamom. I mean, you walk in there, and it's just, whoo. I mean, it's incredible. It's like walking into an Eastern market, and you just, your senses are assaulted. And it's so cool coming out of that you know, crisp, clean alpine air into this warm, dank, dense, sultry, sexy, smelling, spicy environment. Woo! I mean, it's really cool. You're just in a totally different world. And then he said, I've still got all this hot water. What am I going to do with it? I know. You know, we need, we, we need cows, caviar, and bananas. That's it. Caviar. That's what I had forgotten. <laughs> 60,000 head of sturgeon. 35 pounds apiece. He's going to be harvesting his first uh, harvested caviar this year. Swiss caviar. 35 pounds a piece times 60,000 head. That's a lot of meat. And then he went on to say, you know what else we need? We need a restaurant, somewhere to serve these bananas, cows, and caviar. <laughs> Not all together on the same plate. Uh, so we opened two restaurants. He's got this, the terrasserie, and then he's got another little cafe. And then he's got this other thing where he's got a museum there that shows all about geothermal heating, what it is to, to really tap into, into existing resources. You've got this whole museum where the, about the spice trade, about how we've connected to each other and shared cultures through the products that we extract from the earth. It's so cool. Through that tunnel, 200,000 Germans every year flock to eat at this restaurant. 85 jobs created in this tiny little hamlet due to this hot water. And at the end of the day, that water goes into the stream as pure as it was, filtered by the sturgeon at 0.25 degrees above the natural temperature with no energy input. What I love about that is that it really shows that sustainable resource management, which I'll get to in a second, <laughs> is really a human story. There's nothing as unsexy as sustainable. You know, it, maintain the status quo. Nothing sexy there. And the dialogue in front of us about food specifically, it's not about finding more food to feed more people, but it's really about better nourishing people with the resources that we already have accessible to us. And the title of this panel, I would say, should have really have been restoring resources through management, as that, I think, is a more active dialogue and one that acknowledges that we are currently putting our place in the systems of this world in deep jeopardy. Restoring resources through management is a more hopeful, it's a more useful and a more human way to consider our predicament, to heal our wounded planet even as we continue to take from it. It's not nature that's in danger. It's our current reality within nature that is in danger. And we seek to feed a very complicated hunger. Through food, we seek to nourish with much more than just calories. Dinner is a ritual of place, of self, of community of sharing and of giving, of joy and of health. It's also about a reverence to our place in the systems of this world. And this world can, I truly believe, provide for the needs of the coming 7 billion, for the coming 9 billion. But this world will never be able to provide for our desires. The compelling narrative of conservation is really a story of responsible consumption. It's not about what we don't do. It's not about what we sacrifice or abstain from, but rather it's what we do and how we do it. As we talk of restorative resource management, we must also begin a dialogue about sustainable resource use. It's not enough to just have green products like that sturgeon if we use it unwisely. If you have sustainable shrimp and you put it on an all-you-can-eat shrimp buffet, fail. You failed at the human aspect, not the environmental aspect. 
And as I saw in the example of fruit again, restoration is really creativity in the presence of decline and or liability. It is creativity in redefining economic value. And sustainability is really about redefining our values, re-examining the products that we already have on our plates, such as the work that Patricia Malouf is doing. And it's also about re-examining our expectations of maintaining our place in this ecosystem. And this dialogue luckily begins with dinner. Dinner is the confluence of nearly every scientific enterprise that there is. Dinner is universal. It is human. Dinner is small portions of protein, diverse protein. It is giant piles of green beans, broccoli, quinoa, you know, sweet potatoes with a cilantro, almond, pesto. It's, it's good. <laughs> but dinner is joy. Dinner is reverence. Dinner is family. Dinner is our place in the systems of this world. And the very best part about this is that beginning to culti under, cultivate an understanding of this, to begin the conversation of uh, inspiring people to care about the planet is beyond doable. It's, it's actually just delicious. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you.